Powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Now, live from inside the Matt Black Kia Studios, it's Football at Four. And Football at Four is powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. It's brought to you today by East Coast Roofing Siding Windows, serving all of South Jersey. If you call, they'll show up online at eastcoastroofing.com. We've been asking you today, best concert, favorite concert, one concert you wish you could see, dead or alive. Uh, got some good ones coming in. We'll answer some more throughout the day on the text board. You guys have been flooding the text board with your responses to that. Adam Kaplan is here, football at four. We got questions for Eagles training camp less than two weeks to go. And he joins us now from InsideTheBirds.com and the Inside the Birds podcast, which is doing a full NFC East preview with Greg Cosell. So check that out on all Inside the Birds platforms. What's going on, Adam? Happy Friday. Same to you. Yeah, good talking to you, Mike. So, yeah, the first Greg Cosell show, we dropped that on Thursday morning. That's on every pod platform plus YouTube. On Monday, I believe we do – yeah, we did Cowboys. So I think we're doing the Washington Commanders on Monday morning, then the Giants and then the, Cow- the Eagles, excuse me, to kick off training camp. And then we got maybe one or two surprises coming with some interviews that we got coming up. And, oh, by the way, as you talked about the concerts, like your favorite concert, I, it's hard to narrow – I'm not a big concert guy, but it's hard to narrow down. But seeing Elton John and Billy Joel together some years ago was very cool, you know, when wow. they did the dual thing yeah, in Philly. Now, that one uh, has been on a lot of – a couple of our listeners have texted yeah. that particular one. Love that one. Yeah, my wife and I saw them I, uh, like, well over a decade ago. Now, you, this is corny, i got to tell you. By the way, do you know Elton John's playing in Philly tonight? I saw that, yeah, I saw that. This one's kind of corny, but – and, you, and, and the funny thing is, I was surprised at how many younger people were there, but seeing Neil Diamond was kind of cool about five years ago. That, that was uh, that also in Philly. I, I'm sort of like a closet fan, you know, it's with Neil one. Diamond. Well, yeah, I thought that was good. And then the most memorable one, because I was in school then, I was seeing Hall and Oates in, uh, at Ohio University in 1985. Uh, this was absolutely at the high, their height, their total height in 1985 when Big Bam Boom came out. And I remember sitting in like the fifth row at the Convocation Center, uh, I, think, I can't remember if it was Daryl Hall John. It said, hey, anyone from Philly here? And, of course, I raised my hand, and they acknowledged me, which was really cool. So those would be some of my, my memories of concerts. That's a good one. Um, yeah, Neil Diamond I always like because he and I share a birthday. Oh, really? Yeah. What are the chances of that? That's really cool. Yeah, so anytime cool. somebody says Neil Diamond, like it's like a second-class citizen, I'm like, nah, 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 nah. Neil Diamond and I share a birthday. Well, you know, like when you look at your birthday, you look at what famous people have sure. your birthday, and he's like the only guy I could find that's like somewhat yeah. famous is Neil so R- R- Rich Gannon and Chris Carter and I think we're born uh, in the same year within one day of each other. <laughs> yeah, it's just weird. Yeah, it's, and I, I know Rich a little bit, but uh, yeah, it, it, it is, I do that. I'm sure most of us do that, uh, particularly when uh, people start wishing us uh, happy birthday, seeing on Twitter who else gets the uh, happy birthday. Yeah. All right, well, uh, Football 4, as uh, we said at the Open, we're less than two weeks from the uh, Eagles' first training camp practice. They report on the 26th. They practice on the 27th. So well, let's see what Adam Kaplan's going to be looking for uh, when they get there in two weeks. Number one on the list on offense, uh, what about Shane Steichen as the play caller? What's this offense going to look like? Different, same, new wrinkles? What do you think? Yeah, and, and look, the, the first practice for Steichen as a full-time play, play caller will be on the 27th. The report on the 26th. So you're talking about, Mike, in, in, in 11 days report, 12 days is the first practice. This is interesting. This, to me, is, cannot be over-discussed because he confirmed, as you know, Mike, before their OTA season ended, that he took over around midseason as a play caller. And I know what, what teams will do. Their opponents, and I'm sure Detroit will do it because they played the Eagles in the first week and they played the Eagles last year. They're going to want to go back and look at how the play calling changed uh, you, you never know exactly which game it is, but see how it, it changed from Sirianni to Steichen. Now, we know because of the struggles that Jalen Hurts had that they became a running team, and, and he did a great job in terms of the run game. Uh, Steichen did it, designing it, because Hurts, as you know, became a meaningful part of it. You could, you could, you could argue that he was their best rusher at times last season. So you, you have to ask yourself this question, what is next for Shane Steichen at the beginning of the season being the play caller? I believe, Mike, with the, with the group of receivers they have now, led by A.J. Brown, Smith now does not have to be their top pass target. 
Uh, now Watkins will not be a starter. He'll be their third receiver. Zach Pascal should, should share that third role and sometimes the fourth role. And he's a tough guy talking to, I ran into one of the players recently, who said that he, he just had su- such leadership and a, and a veteran. You could, and this player said that he could totally see why Nick Sirianni wanted Pascal because he, he understands what, it's, what it takes to, to play in the National Football League. And he's, he's the one guy who's been there. You know, Zach Pascal, Mike, let's not forget, the Titans didn't want him. Washington didn't want him, and then he, he, he really revived his career with the Colts as a former undrafted free agent in 2017. And uh, this guy will certainly help them, particularly in the red zone, and he could block for the run game. But overall, Mike, I'm expecting them to play more three-receiver sets, not to, see, not, to, not to be so much too tight end heavy, and then also using personnel a little bit better than they, this group did last year. Um, Steichen there calling plays now. He's going to have Jalen Hurts. So, Will Steichen have a different, better version of Jalen Hurts? Can he make a big jump in his second year as the starting quarterback? That is something we all will have our eyes on at camp. Yeah, Mike, I think the big reason why Sirianni is keeping Steichen as a play caller is to not ask Hurts to learn yet another offense going back to his high school days. It's remarkable. I mean, he just he cannot – it's been rare in his career to, to be able to play in the same scheme – uh, this will be his first time as a professional playing the same scheme back-to-back years. So this is good. This will help. This is actually a smart move. I, my understanding, that's part of why they did this, uh, to keep the continuity going to help Hurts out. And, yeah, I, I'm, I am so fascinated to see what they can do. We know about the receiver core. Uh, we know about this offensive line, which is the best of the National Football League. And they have very good depth. and They're very young also uh, on the offensive line, other than really – Lane Johnson, who's now in his 30s, and, and Kelsey, it's very young, which is good. You know, that's the, that's the thing here, and their depth is very young. So th- this, this team, this offense, Mike, we, we struggled sometimes watching. It was actually painful sometimes to watch their offense. It shouldn't be anymore. And Steichen and Sirianni and, uh, and Brian Johnson, the quarterback coach who I know is involved, they, they should be able to get this thing going in year two. Yeah, that should uh, – well, that's definitely a big one. Steichen, Hurts, and then – uh, Second-year running back Kenny Gainwell. How much uh, of a role does he have? Uh, does he cut into Miles Sanders' role at all? I think uh, we're all going to be watching Sanders because he's on a contract. Yeah, I do. I think he's going to cut into it and potentially in a big way. Wait to hear what Greg Cosell says. I, 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 I don't want to give it away, but I'm just telling you. You know, we've been on Gainwell. We actually we didn't know that Eagles were going to draft him. This is one of this is one of our favorite players for the draft coming into the draft at 21. And the Eagles surprised us by drafting him in the fifth round. This has turned out to be a very good value, and he, he had a good role. You're going to watch Gainwell's role expand in the pass game. He, he's going to be a big part of that. You know, Miles Sanders, uh, uh, I, I had been pretty much a defender of Sanders for all the negativity people throw at him. We know about the injury history. That's not much, that, there's not a lot he could control. He could always get in better shape. But here's the problem that Sanders has. Mike, below average hands and, and a below average pass protector. At best, sometimes they even average. It's rare for him to grade out super high. It's a pass protector, as I understand it. So Gainwell's going to cut into his, whatever they do on third down. You can expect Gainwell to play the most snaps of all the running backs on third down. And also in first and second down, perhaps, if he has a great camp, who knows if he, he takes some snaps away from his Sanders there. They, and as you said, Mike, Sanders on the last year of his rookie deal, this is only Gainwell's second year. It was a four-year deal. And of course, you have Boston Scott, but Boston, that, that – Boston Scott's on a one-year deal, and Gainwell, I'm telling you, is going to have a bigger role than people know. Uh, next uh, bullet point here as we look at uh, some of the questions less than two weeks, uh, Dallas Goddard, will he have a breakout season? You know, ESPN's doing this uh, executive poll with players, coaches, executives. Uh, he came in at number six as the sixth best tight end in football. So it appears that people around the league are ready for him to have a breakout season. You know, yeah, and plus he doesn't have to deal with Zach Ertz anymore. Uh, obviously, the Eagles tried to trade Ertz uh, last offseason. They could not get the value that they wanted, so they waited. And they had to wait to, to do Goddard's contract and, and, until Ertz was traded at the trade deadline, and they got the deal done uh, in late November. But when you look at the situation, Goddard, I don't want to say he's been an underachiever, but he just should be a little bit better than he has been. I know he's had a minor injury history. Seemingly every year he's had some injuries. The hands every, t- every once in a while is a bad drop. So as uh, one person with the Eagles told me, sometimes he tries to run with the ball before he has it. Watch the Washington game, the, the second game, uh, to, for a good example of that. So, yes, it can be and it will be because he doesn't have to deal with Ertz. 
They love Jack Stoltz, the number two tight end, but it's Goddard's deal here. He, he signed for a deal. He signed his, his big, big extension. He finally got that done, and I'm expecting him to have a huge season, Mike. He's a very gifted player. Came into the league, and his first year talking to the Eagles then, in 18, he, he was a very good blocker, and he's developed himself to be a good pass catcher. He just has to be more consistent, and I expect that to happen this season. Yeah, he's a guy that, uh, with full uh, touches and full snaps this year, could have a really big breakout season. And then uh, we talked about the tight ends, ESPN's rankings of the top ten. Lane Johnson was number seven. Jordan Maialata was an honorable mention. And one of the executives said he's not a household name now um, league-wide, but at this time next year he may be. So are we looking at an elite left tackle we're about to find out? Well, he's in the top ten easily of left tackles. The question is, can he be elite? He's very good. He's not great yet. He will, and by the way, for Pro Bowl, he has a big bonus, I think a million-dollar bonus if he makes the Pro Bowl. So, and he had, and remember, as I explained to you, Mike, you can't be an alternate. You can't be, you can't be a replacement. You have to be named originally, voted in to get that Pro Bowl bonus. He's, an, uh, he's probably, in my time covering, the, uh, covering this team in particular, the most unlikely success story that I could remember. Now, I'm sure some of your listeners could tell you that things that surprise is like, uh, obviously, Corey Clement was an incredible surprise. 17, Mike, but he never sustained it. Corey Clement, by the way, is still a free agent. I would have to say that Jordan Mylott eventually will be a top three left tackle. I don't know that he could ever be number one. It could be someday, but I don't know that he'll ever be that great. But he will be one of the elite tackles in the, in, in the National Football League because he just has an issue with his hand placement. It's still not totally natural to him because he's a former rugby player. But this is one of the best picks in Eagles history, Mike. I could all go that far. There's yeah. no question. Easy. One of the easy, best picks in Eagles history. Easily. Uh, yep. All right, defense. John Gannon, how much better is John Gannon's defense going to be in year number two just with the upgrade in personnel? Yeah, and by the way, I ran into Brandon Graham. Uh, he looks great. Uh, at uh, this past uh, Earlier this week at the Mid-Penn Bank uh, golf outing for uh, cancer research in uh, Hershey, PA, and <laughs> – He's, I, I'll tell you what, he's moving around really good, and he looked good, and what a joy to be around him. See, this is the thing now, because they have so much talent, Mike. At the end last season, you, you know, people wanted to criticize Gannon. Some of it was warranted. Some of it was over the top. But the one thing you could defend Gannon on is he didn't control the talent that he had to work with. It just wasn't very good. But when you look at it, Graham, who didn't really play much last season because of the Achilles, he's back. Uh, from what I understand, he looked very good in OTAs. Jordan Davis, their first-round pick, we'll get to him in a, in, a, in a minute. Kaiser White added as a most likely when they play 34. He'll be one of their starting inside linebackers. The question for him is where will they line him up if they go to a 43 or 52 front? Uh, Nicobe Dean also added at linebacker. Hassan Reddick, his first job is to be a stand-up outside linebacker. That's a major addition. Uh, James Bradbury, who we could also talk about. Jaquaski Tart, love that addition. Mike, there are no more excuses for Jonathan Gaddon. This defense has to be better, absolutely has to be better. I believe it's going to be much better, not just better, but much better. Uh, Jordan Davis, number one pick. They uh, made a bold move to get him. So how much will he play in your number one? Yeah, I don't think a lot because it's going to be Fletcher Cox and $14 million and Javon Hargrave was on the final year's deal. And, I mean, there are your two tackles. Now, if they want to go with a three-tackle front, they certainly can do that. Uh, we've seen Fletcher Cox line up on the outside. I don't know how much they'll do that, but when they go to a 43 front, it's Cox and Hargrave. If they go to a three-man front, you could certainly play Jordan Davis as the nose. There's certain things you could do with Jordan Davis. I don't expect him to play more than like 30% of the snaps, but he will start. One way or the other, he will be a major player and a factor in 2023. And I'm interested to see what kind of shape he comes into in two weeks, Mike, when the Eagles report, and, and see what he weighed. I'm going to try to find out what he weighed in at. We reported first last year that Jordan Mylott in their offseason program was 403 pounds. Now, he got himself down to 375, and I think his playing weight was 380. And if you, I, I, I've seen Jordan Mylott twice this offseason. He's absolutely jacked up. I mean, he looks amazing. You, I've never seen a guy it's 380 and 6'8", and to say he looks like he's in great physical shape. <laughs> uh, Adam Kaplan, football at four. Hassan Reddick, uh, what does he add to this defense? How good can he be? My only issue is, I don't want to call it an issue, is just, but does Gannon understand how to get the most out of this guy? Je, uh, uh, Avery last year, you know, he, Avery was really just a pass rusher in his career. They made him a, 
overhang player, really more against the run. Didn't really play much in nickel, which surprised us. It, it, Jerome Avery has always been known for, if anything, to be a pass rusher. He, he'll get to do that. That's why he signed with the Steelers to be a, a stand-up outside linebacker in their 34. I, I, I'm just – he's going to be good. No, don't, don't mistake me here. Reddick's going to be good. But the, for him to, to justify that $15 million a year contract, you can't just line him up at outside linebacker and stand him up. You've got to move him sometimes. And I'm very interested to see if he's going to be a static player, meaning he just stands in one place. Or do they use him as a joke or pass rusher? You can do that as a stand-up linebacker in a 43. You can do that. Jim, the late, great Jim Johnson did that. You absolutely can move this guy around. And that, that to me, if, the, if Gannon has a vision of, of moving guys around to create matchups, this defense could be really fascinating this season. All right. Uh, Jaquaski tart or Anthony Harris? That could be a big battle at safety there. It is. I'm told that absolutely – Tart is back on Harris. He's, he's not backing up. Epps, Epps definitely starting the other side. Joukowsky Tart is a guy that I think sometimes we get carried away. Yes, he can hit. He's a really good tackle. He, he could be an intimidator. There's no doubt about that. But he also could play back. He could play post safety. You can move him around. He, in fact, he started his career off as, as more of a free safety than a box player. But because of his size, uh, you, you can move him around. And, 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 and he became more of a box player late, later in his career. The only problem with him, Mike, is injuries. He's had a significant injury history going back to 2017. Missed too much time. You have 30 games in, in over a five-year period. That's a concern. But he's, he's got maybe two years left in him. And he's good. See, the Eagles may not call it. They're not, from what I understand, they're not really calling it a, a, a competition. But trust me on this. It will be a competition in training camp. We'll talk more about the battles, Mike, uh, as we get closer. Sure. Maybe we'll do this next week. But that's one I look forward to because Tart's a really good football player. And how cool is it? He's back with his college teammate from Samford and James Bradbury. And speaking of Bradbury and uh, competition, uh, how much is it any competition that Bradbury is an upgrade over Steve Nelson? Yeah, this is, this is one where it's such a no-brainer for the Eagles. Uh, Bradbury was, I'm told, asking teams for $10 million in cash per season. He didn't get that from the Eagles on his one-year deal. It's uh, just over $7 million, but he can make up to $10 million based on certain parameters. But he's a major upgrade to Nelson. He's longer. He's more athletic. He's smooth. He moves better. He's a much better football player. The only thing about Bradbury, history will show you, he's much better in zone. Now the question is, Mike, for Jonathan Gannon and the Eagles. The Eagles played the, played the most zone defense in the National Football League for the first half in 2021. 91% zone defense, which is unheard of in today's NFL. Then they went, they went way more man than they had in the first half and the se- as the second half progressed. But I would say right now, uh, not only is Bradbury a major upgrade, this secondary now. See, the thing about the Eagles offseason, Mike, every level of their defense, their, their, their front, their linebackers, who you no longer can say the Eagles don't have talent linebacker, uh, they, they've added one, two, three, potentially three starters at linebacker in white, Dean and Reddick, or three guys who play the most snaps. Kyron Johnson, who I didn't mention, who's a really exciting rookie, who play, probably play mostly on special teams. And, of course, as we just said, Joukowsky, Tart, and James Bradbury. And don't forget Marcus Epps. I know he, he's a full-time starter now for the first time in his career, and he's also on the final year of his rookie deal, Mike. So he's got a lot to play for. He's, he, he's a good football player that I don't think enough fans know about. All right, Adam Kaplan, Football at Four. Check out the Inside the Birds podcast for an in-depth look at the NFC East teams with Greg Cosell on all the Inside the Birds platforms. We'll be back on Monday with more Football at Four as we get one week closer to Eagles camp. We'll actually uh, be down on the countdown to one week on Monday's show right here on the Sports Bash. Adam Kaplan, have a good weekend, man. You too, thank you. Uh, There he goes, Adam Kaplan here on the Bash.